communist Polish government in, in, in Poland. And it was, what do they do? And what they did was, they, they backed the communist Polish government, which meant that they'd got a Polish government they didn't approve of with an army, a massive army in Europe. Uh, so it became a real problem. So they decided to pull all the Polish Second Corps and his army back to England um, so they could disarm them and decide what to do with them. Um, they had the, uh, the uh, presentation for the end of the war celebrations in London. Uh, it's a big rally in 1946, but Stalin said that he didn't want the Poles to uh, attend, so they didn't attend, or they, wouldn't, they, they weren't allowed to attend. But Poland changed completely. As, as was, this is a post-World War II map of Europe. You can see what Poland looked like and what it is to this day as it is now with my dad's village. So completely different to what it was. My dad, though, did get his uh, Polish Army Medal for fighting with the Polish Second Corps and his army. His Monte Cassino Cross. He was awarded the standard four British military medals, but he never claimed them. I claimed them, and I've got them, but uh, he never claimed them because lots of Poles didn't want it. They, they, they washed their hands with it because of this Western betrayal. But as I say, they were brought back to England. My, my dad arrived uh, back at uh, Liverpool, where he was told not to contact his family, never to speak to them or say anything to anybody, which he never did to the day he died. And they formed what was known as the Polish Resettlement Corps, where they could actually train these Poles in, in, in a different culture, how to adapt to civilian life in a different country. Uh, and this is my dad in uh, the Poland Resettlement Corps shortly after the war, and he was allocated to, to be a miner. Of all the other Poles, though, those that had been sent as civilians to these camps also came back to England, although there's a bit of emigration to America, Canada, Australia, and places, Argentina after the war. There was a huge Polish contingent in England after the war and all over the world they had an ex combatants association which still exists to this day. My dad's journey, if we have a look at it, from his village in Svakshti right across the Soviet Union to Kalima and then back to find the Polish army around the um, Middle East here in Tashkent, then across the Caspian Sea through the Middle East um, to Palestine, through Egypt, into Italy and then back through Liverpool to York, where he was demobbed. So a massive journey, massive journey. Um, it was about 45,000 kilometres that he did. After the war, Anders uh, remained in England, and he was a leading figure in the salvation of the Poles, uh, which he started through the war and continued after the war. And after the war, he suffered libelous and slanderous accusations of crimes against Poland by the communist government. And they revoked his Polish citizenship, as they did with my father. And in post-war communist Poland, you couldn't mention his name. He didn't exist, nor was his successes. The Polish Second Court didn't exist. But he never gave up fighting for a free Poland. And also, he devoted himself to the dedication of the care, uh, dedication and care of his old comrades <coughs> of all ranks. He died in 1970 and he's actually buried within the shadow of the abbey in a big Polish graveyard that exists at Monte Cassino. And he remained, as I say, prominent and active until his death in 1970. Um, and today, though, in the non communist Poland, he's finally recognised and celebrated by the government of Poland as a national hero. Back to uh, what was now Belarus. My grandfather and my grandmother had lost the three sons, my dad to the Russians, his two brothers to the Germans, he'd lost a sister earlier on, so these are my two aunties. But when my dad was taken away, unbeknownst to him, his mother was pregnant and he had another brother which he never met. And this is an uncle that my father never knew or didn't even know about which is really sad. Anyway, I'm so lucky that my dad survived, so I can tell this story. So if I think about it, he survived two invasions, arrest, imprisonment, the journey into exile, 
uh, the gulags, the journey from exile, finding Anders' army, the war, and then afterwards, it's incredible really what, what he went through. I'm so incredibly lucky uh, to be here, to be able to speak about it. My grandfather died in 1970. This is the uncle that my dad never knew. Um, with my grandmother and my two aunties in the Kabul uh, Polish Cemetery. My grandmother died in 1970. Um, and my dad, as I mentioned, became a miner. He actually worked at this colliery, which is a snipe, just up the road in Ashton. Um, it's not a picture of my dad, it's actually a friend's dad with his best friend, who was actually Polish, but it's just a nice picture of the snipe at the colliery. Um, but after the war, through the Red Cross, my dad got in touch with his two brothers who had been liberated from Dachau by the Americans and had settled in France. So they got together, this is my dad and my uncle Frank. Uh, uncle Frank died in the mid 80s um, and my dad died in 94 without ever being in contact with his family that he left behind ever again. However, I received confirmation uh, when I checked with the Russian authorities about my dad and they sent me this letter and basically it was a list of people that had actually been um, well they call it a rehabilitation but it's like a pardon for the crimes that they committed and this is a list of people that had, uh, were, were arrested with my dad and they're all pardoned but when they get to my dad it was denied so maybe he was that partisan that we thought he was and this was on the 50th anniversary of his arrest, it's, it's 1989, it's 1939 that it, it, it was arrested. So, maybe he was a partisan, but I don't know. The village he came from, Schwachstig, is still there. You see, it's actually in Cyrillic, Schwachstig. It's changed nothing since the time my dad was there, and possibly even the time when his father had built it in the early 1900s. It's a tiny little wooden village, no electricity, no in, indoor toilets or anything, no telephones. It's incredibly primitive. It's fantastic. I, I love it there. Um, but as I say, this is now Belarus. They don't even speak Russian there. They speak, speak Russian. Um, but after my dad had died and the fall of communism and the advent of this internet, we actually got in touch with the village. and. Uh, Fantastically, we actually got in touch with my dad's sister who was still alive and we've, we've since been over several times. If you remember my dad's house, this little wooden shack that he lived in, well, that's what it looks like today. It's still there and still owned by our family. In fact, the first time we went over, my dad's sister was still living in that house. It's, it hasn't changed in a hundred years. It's incredible. The shops are so primitive. When you go in the shops, they still use abacuses. They don't have till. They have abacuses. It's fantastic. Um, this is a recent visit with my son and a friend in the town of Kabilnik. And you can see it's, it's hardly changed. This was during the First World War when the, Russia, uh, the Germans occupied it. That was taken in 1915. That was taken in 2018 or something. So in a hundred years, it hadn't changed. However, the town name, Kabilnik, uh, was changed to Naroch by the Russians in 1964. Uh, in the graveyard there, there's the Vincent Plesh at my dad's grave that I, I visited on several occasions. But I just feel so lucky compared to my cousins and these, the, my, some of my cousins outside the house in, uh, in, in, in Shvaksti there. Um, and I, I, I know I keep repeating, but I can't believe what a privileged upbringing I've had compared to my cousins there. My dad, who'd been a driver with, the, uh, with Anders' army, bizarrely, his brother that he never met was a, an, a driver for the Red Army. And when we went, I was so pleased to be able to meet my uncle Valeri. Um, and it was bizarre because when I spoke to him, he had mannerisms similar to my dad's. How could it be? You know, he, he didn't know me dad. It was, it was really strange. And in the village of Schwaxti, I had to talk to people that remembered my dad. This old guy talked about him, and in particular, the house right opposite was a little old lady, and she, she talked about, about my dad with my dad's uh, nickname and everything. It was fantastic being able to talk to her. She said she could speak perfect Polish, but they, they only speak Russian there. Mm. 
but it's just brilliant to be able to, to meet this lovely old lady. Every year at Monte Cassino there's a commemoration and every five years there's a special anniversary. And I was fortunate to be there in 2009 when I took this picture. And in this picture what we've got was the, at the time, the president of Poland, a guy called Kaczynski. His wife, Maria Kaczynski, who was actually born in the next village to my dad in Belarus. Um, the lady here is Irina Anders, the wife of General Anders, who sang the Red Poppies at Monte Cassino for the very first time at Monte Cassino in the ruins. And her daughter, General Anders' daughter, Anna Maria Anders, who is now a very significant Polish politician and the ambassador to Poland in Italy. And she, uh, we, we, we communicate on a regular basis. She's fantastic uh, with, her, with, her, with her help and everything. Um, but the intrigue of what happened continues. Less than a year later, in April 20, 2010, the Polish government were visiting the Katyn Memorial near Smolensk. Uh, and there was 96 members of the Polish government and dignitaries on the Polish government plane as it approached Smolensk and it crashed, killing all 96. Now, I mean, make of it what you will, there's lot, again, lots of conspiracy theories, but sadly, like Kaczynski and his wife, and lots of the old Polish government in exile that were still alive at that time, sadly died. Um, but it was, you know, the most significant loss of Polish uh, uh, dignitaries since the Sikorsky crash in 1943. So, Again, lots of theories about what may or may not have happened there. Um, 